Yes, I believe Lucas has graciously volunteered to be our Jabber scribe. Um, right. Mary, as for Blue Sheets, um, I will just put people's names in the notes um, and drop a link to that here. Hang on. WebEx recording will give you a list. Even better. Very handy. Okay. Um, Eric, let me know when we're ready to go. Yeah, can you all see the slides? Yes. Sweet, and if I like go forwards and backwards, you like see them changing? Uh, yes. That's so satisfying, thank you, cool. <laughs> have you started recording? I believe if you check, you should have a little red thing in the corner of your meeting window that says that you are currently- Recording in progress, yes. Okay, oh, we're live. <laughs> all right, uh, let's get going. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to the uh, first interim meeting for MASK in 2021. Uh, here's to a better year. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just a note well, as per usual. Um, I assume you're all familiar with it, um, but if not, please take, your, uh, take a second to familiarize yourself with it. Um, just a you know, reminder to uh, please be respectful and courteous uh, when speaking and uh, when discussing things. Uh, and hopefully this can be a super productive meeting. Next slide, please. Uh, here's some helpful links to, to get going um, and to help you uh, uh, engage during the meeting. Um, if you pull open, oh, shoot, um, that is not the right notes link, <laughs> actually. <laughs> I dropped it in the chat here, though. Um, uh, so uh, if you pop in over there, uh, drop your name um, on the list or... Uh, if there is a spot for that. Um, I made a spot at the end. Thank you, Ecker. Um, that'd be super helpful. I will also get the list from WebEx. Um, um, uh, before going further though, uh, I'd like to just uh, pause briefly. Uh, we don't yet have a note taker. Uh, we have a Jabber scribe. Um, so if someone could volunteer to take notes, that would be lovely. I can do that. Was that Mike? Yes. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, here's the agenda for today. Um, uh, we're first gonna go over some, um, um, I guess, process-oriented things, uh, just to level set everyone, uh, given changes that have happened in the past couple of months. And we're gonna get into some presentations on the main working group documents and some auxiliary documents as well. Um, and then stuff that carried over from ITF 109 that we didn't have time to get to um, is at the end. Uh, and if we have time to get to them this time, we will. Otherwise, we will um, we will punt them like we did prior. Um, um, does anyone have any adjustments they'd like to make to this before we move forward? Uh, once again, I believe IP proxy requirements I will be handling since um, Dallas was uh, out of office on vacation. Cool. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Uh, if nothing, uh, just quickly next slide then. Um, right, uh, so just a quick update on um, how we're using GitHub um, and how documents are progressing. So there's been like a flurry of activity on both the IP proxy requirements document as well as uh, Connect UDP. And so thank you to all the, the, first of all, the editors as well as all the participants who have been you know, checking in on GitHub, commenting, helping move these forward and improve them. Um, uh, we've observed some sort of uh, misalignment with how it's, the tool is being used. Um, in particular, some issues have been filed, but then closed without, um, you know, particular details as to what the resolution was. Um, uh, and I'll, there are probably lots of ways you could address this in order to like make sure that everyone's, like, you know, time using GitHub is uh, productive and uh, useful and welcoming and inviting and so on. Um, as we think uh, a good approach going forward would be to start using pull requests similar to how the uh, IP proxying document uses them, uh, both to uh, track specific changes in response to issues, as well as to invite uh, feedback and um, uh, comments and so on, uh, on changes as they're coming down the pipe. Um, and hopefully um, this is like uh, not much of a, you know, a burden on, on editors, on people submitting PRs, that we don't lose any velocity moving forward. Um, we, we definitely don't want to impose like super strict process, like uh, you know happened at Quick during the late stages, where there was 
you know, uh, like very tight consensus control over everything that landed in the document. Um, we still want the editors to have the discretion to move changes forward, but we just need a better way um, to, to track the specific changes that happened in response to um, issues. Um, so I'll, I'll pause here, I guess, for questions on this particular proposal. Uh, and it looks like there's two queued up. So, Miria? Actually, I let go, David, go first. Okay, David? All right. Yes, yeah, so this uh, was clearly directed at me, uh, which is totally fair. Uh, so I want to apologize to folks here. The uh, the issue here was only a matter of timing, where the chairs asked me to get these updates, the documents out er early enough that folks had time to review them before this interim. And so I cut quite a bit of corners to get that done in time. So I don't plan on doing that moving forward. I will like be better about using PRs and like writing resolution. This wasn't like an attempt for me to like hide things or anything. It was just that I was really strapped for time and trying to spend a little bit of time with my family during the, the holiday break. So apologies for that. Uh, we'll do better from now on. Yeah, uh, to be clear, I don't think anyone's pointing fingers. Um, and in fact, like the, the work that you put in did get us new drafts to review during this particular meeting. So thank you for the, for the time that you did spend on this stuff. Um, um, Hopefully, like this doesn't come off as like adversarial in any particular way. All right, uh, Miria, I guess. You want to go yeah. Next? Um, yes. Uh, definitely. Thanks, David. Um, I I wanted to say that uh, one problem was that it was not clear how issues were addressed, and having pull requests would make that definitely more visible. So that's really good. The other problem, or not problem, but the other thing is also that I think we shouldn't just like close an issue without having consensus. So it, it has to be more than one person who agrees that the issue is resolved before we close it. I think that's a more important part. So even if you update the document and submit, uh, put the PRs in or merge the PRs in and submit the document, please keep the, the issues open until there's some agreement. I think that's an important part. Um, and another comment I wanted to make is also that um, currently we have a lot of issues on GitHub and we have like some discussion there. It's usually only like a small set of um, people, but I think that we are at an, at an early stage where we need for some of the issues, we need really broader discussion in the working group. So everything that's more on a not like specific protocol or editing the document basis, but more on an architecture general decision, I think it would still be good to have an issue, but then also bring the discussion to the mailing list and see if there's further feedback so we can actually reach consensus. Uh, yeah, and I think you're, you're certainly encouraged, uh, whether you're the file of the issue or someone just tracking along to, to you know, kind of uh, mirror the conversation on the mailing list if you think that would be helpful. Um, I remind folks, though, that uh, uh, when we first set out to uh, decide how we were going to use how to, you know, engage um, and, uh, you know, operate on documents, um, we are using it uh, as a way of uh, discussing and uh, tracking all of the issues um, so that th there's no... Um, uh, it, it, it's possible for us to have all the discussion on the GitHub issue and then only confirm consensus on the list. Um, that is uh, sort of um, folded into the, the clause uh, that we agreed upon when we decided how we would use GitHub. So, um, uh, but that said, like, if you think there's uh, potentially other people who are not following GitHub who could benefit from seeing it on the list, uh, I mean, of course, you're welcome to share that on the list. Uh, yeah, actually, give me an ex uh, let me give you an example. I think the discussion we had about extendability you brought to the list as the chairs, that was really good because that was a really like high level design issue, right? It's not a co concrete thing where like I can say, you know, I have to change this in the document and we're still at this stage, right? So I don't want to overload this process, but I really want to make sure people are involved and we get some common view and some consensus here at the beginning. Excellent. Um, I think Mike is next. Mike? Uh, yeah, so two things I wanted to highlight. First off, I have kind of, kind of feel like closing issues when the PRs are merged is probably a reasonable thing to do um, because we shouldn't be merging PRs that we haven't reached some level of agreement on in discussion on the issue. But for people who want to see what has happened and potentially disagree with it after the fact, uh, I think it would be useful if we started putting a change log in the document, at least when we drop new versions on data tracker. Um, I, we found in quick that that helped a lot that people could go back and check the change log for all the substantive modifications that got merged. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I again, I, I guess I'll leave it to the editors uh, to decide whether or not they want to include a change log. Um, certainly, you couldn't hurt. Um, um, on the, who can on, on closing issues uh, in response to you know PRs being merged, um, uh, chairs, we think that's a reasonable thing to do. Um, if if based on the the content in the PR, we 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 feel or the editors feel that the, it adequately addresses the issue. Um, and of course, if there are, you know, if there are people who are following the issue, who feel it's not been resolved, they can comment on that and the chairs will assess and see if they, whether or not we need to reopen the issue. Um, that's the beauty of GitHub. We can open and close issues at will. Um, although we don't want to revisit things that we have consensus on, um, uh, I, I, I don't want to um, have them linger, I guess, for too long. Uh, Mark, I think, if you're HTTP biz. Mark or Tommy, I don't know. I am. Well, exactly. You don't know who you're talking to, do you? Um, I, I would just suggest that maybe we not spend too much time talking about this sort of process things in the meeting, but that whatever process the chairs come up with that they want to get in front of the working group, document it, um, write it down uh, by convention. Most working groups that I see use contributing.md for that. Um, and I will paste into Jabber what HTTP uses, which might be a good starting point because it's more lightweight than what Quick uses. Lovely, thank you. And the, the, the contribution guideline is effectively what you have here. Um, just send PRs, more or less. Um, David? I think Alex is next. Uh, yeah, you, mix, you missed uh, Alex before Mark. Oh, okay, sorry, Alex. Um, I wanted to quickly say what I was uh, trying to do while working with David on the IP proxy requirements is um, every single commit I try to include an explicit reference to the GitHub issue that we were addressing. Um, and what I hope was visible to folks, because um, I, I double checked this in the GitHub UI, is that it should be sh have shown each of the issues that uh, was referenced, sorry, each of the commits that was referencing the issues. Um, so at least for those where we did not have, uh, sorry, where we did have a clear commit addressing the issue, um, there should be evidence in GitHub of what we intended to resolve the issue was. Uh, one thing that we did not do because uh, David primarily chose to review this as one large PR is we did not use the closes tag for the bulk of the edits. So David later on went and um, closed the issues by hand. Um, so I, I apologize if that caused any confusion about why things were being closed on the IP proxy requirements side. Um, that said, I also want to um, bring up something based on what Miria just suggested. Uh, Mary just suggested that at least two people should agree uh, that the issue should be closed. Uh, under that metric, David and I agreed that the issue should be closed. Is that something that we want to have it be acceptable? Because that does not seem like it would end up addressing Mario's concern, as I understand. Um, so just echo back. Yeah, um, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, the point was not about two people to have a number here. The point was about those people who are actually involved in the discussion. Um, and like when I open an issue, I didn't have any chance to comment on the, on the resolution that, or what you thought was a resolution because I didn't see it before you closed the issue. I think that's a problem we had here. So in, um, in the response. interest of time, I think there, there's a couple of folks who are still in the queue. If you have anything that's drastically, massively urgent to say about this, um, we can we can do that, but it would be nice if we could get to the to the actual thing. I think uh, Mark's point about having the the contributing guidelines in the uh, in the repo we can certainly do, and that will give us some very clear text to to bike shed as as we please. Um, but the the intent here is that uh, we're saying there needs to be something where for any issue that is closed, you can go, you can click on it, and you can see here's exactly how it was resolved, and the ask of the editors is to make sure that uh, some form of, of agreement is, is uh, reached when things are merged. And as Chris said, if any if that ever isn't happening, if something is merged and we, we say, oh no, hang on, you know, I didn't agree with this, I don't think we should do this, then uh, please let the chairs know. And like Chris said, we'll look at it and decide whether or not we need to reopen it or if there's a consensus that's been achieved and, and that person is in the rough. So with that, uh, let's keep going, although it looks like Miria has one final comment and we'll move on. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so I, I don't want to make this heavy process or anything, but like I also want to make sure that we just don't close issues and then like lose something or whatever. Um, and like everybody suggested we should trust the editors. I think that's good. In this case, I would really like to see editors edit to the documents that are from a different angle, from a different company, having different use case in mind. So we have more diversity on the editors for both of the documents. Understood. All right, Lucas. You are muted. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So yes, I'm I'm Lucas. I am a new co-author on the HP3 datagrams draft. Um, I'm not going to take much credit or blame here. Uh, David's been working on this. He presented at IETF 109. Um, we, I'll, I'll give a recap of kind of what was covered in 109 and where we're at today, um, just in case people forgot or were confused by the the kind of crossover between HTTP3 datagrams and Connect UDP. Uh, but yeah, the uh, I'll just come aboard to kind of help give some uh, review and an assistance via presentations like this. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is taken verbatim from what we presented or David presented last time. Uh, but you know, for this, effectively what the proposition is, is that when we're using Quick and we're using HP3, every datagram frame, the payload of that frame, um, as seen from the, the HTTP3 layer, starts with this flow ID. And the purpose of the flow ID is to allow kind of multiplexing of, of different uses of datagram within a single quick connection. And you know, the background to that was that we didn't want this in the transport, but the applications that needed demultiplexing could add it. And so that's that's part of the framing. But uh, we wanted to be able to actually have a concrete use case for how to use those logical flow identifiers for something. So in this case, the concrete use case is Connect UDP that uh, we will handle different tunnel connections to some different target server uh, that are identified by, in this case, the authority. So we use the Connect UDP method to reserve a datagram flow ID to this thing. And this is the concept of our multiplexing. You could create another Connect UDP request on a different stream and reserve a different datagram flow ID and you would be okay. Uh, so that's it in a nutshell. Next slide, please. Yes, we had that fun and games from the last time around. This is a Welsh slide, it's much better. So um, we'll get that out of the system. I did put this in myself as well. I preempted the chair. So the next slide, please. Uh, and and yeah, I talked about the kind of the composition or the the structure of the documents and what was defined where. This is what was in the drafts that we had the definition of the connect UDP method and the definition of the datagram flow ID header that the connect UDP method relied on to work together in the single connect UDP document. Um, and then we had uh, Skenazi H3 datagram that defined the concept of a flow ID and how it looked on the wire and the setting to manage datagrams in a generic sense. Um, and then over in Quickland, we had the datagram frame at the transport layer. And so part of the discussion that we had was uh, to allow us to um, find a home for H3 datagram. Where did it fit? It could have gone into any of the working groups, uh, but the, the outcome of the discussion, as I understand it last time, is that we believe Mac is, is the most appropriate home. It, it's possibly not the only place it could go in, but that we, we think that Mask is the correct place to adopt the new document that we have. So if you go to the next slide, please. In order to get a clearer separation of concerns, just focus on the red box here. This is, again, a, a, a capture of the image that David had in the previous set of slides because I'm lazy. Uh, but if we focus on the red box, what we have now in the new updated Skenazi Mask H3 datagram draft is the the definition of the datagram flow ID header. Um, 
the, the, the concept of flow IDs, which helps uh, kind of discuss alongside the header and, and put all of this into a single place uh, so it's easier to reason about, um, and the HB3 datagram setting. And so this is kind of all effectively unchanged, more or less. The concepts are all what we had before, just rehomed, apart from one aspect that came up uh, as part of the discussion around extensibility. So, um, so if we go on to the next slide. Uh, Lucas, quickly, um, uh, Martin has a clarifying question. Yeah, uh, it, on slide one, um, I think you say that the flow ID is part of a, I'm sorry, no, it's slide two, pardon me. That every quick datagram flame starts to flow ID, you mean HTTP3 datagram, correct? So confused. To, to get technical, there, is, there isn't a HTTP3 layer frame that would be sent on a stream. So in HTTP3, all, all frames are effectively are sent on streams. So this is when when you're using the ALPN H3 is highlighted there kindly, uh, that when you receive a datagram on the transport layer, that you should effectively parse the first uh, bar in length integer or 62 bits, I can't quite remember which one, um, as, as a flow ID. Uh, okay, so actually, this thank you. This is a distinction I don't think I understood previously. So the H3, there's no such thing as an HD data damn frame. There's a way of interpreting it quick data. Okay, thank you. I yeah, the it's kind of like a, a reinterpret cast over the top of the thing. It is um, it is a nuance, and it could catch some people out. And I think that's something we should definitely try and do in the document. But... So... Uh, next slide, please, number six. Uh, so yeah, just to give a summary of the headline changes from what we had at 109 to what we have today, the, the draft has been renamed, but we have a continuity of kind of progenity there. Uh, the, the, H, the datagram flow ID head has been moved out of Connect UDP into this new draft. And uh, the, the biggest change maybe that people need to be aware of is that we've changed the value of the datagram flow ID from a, a structured field item of integer type to now a structured field list of integers that can all be parameterized. And I'll explain that briefly in, in some of the slides coming up next. But if you want an easy, lazy way to diff those two things, there's the link to the RFC diff tool for the um, basically the latest ID versions. So next slide, please. Uh, yes, so this is uh, the supporting of the extensibility or multiplicity of different datagram flows. So previously we had a singular uh, integer, which is fine for the simple connect case that we kind of started mask with, but it wasn't easily extensible. Yes, anyone familiar with structured fields will know that you can have parameters on them, and that might be a way to be abused to do some of the things that people said they would like to do with, say, adding a ECN extension, um, but there's many ways to write headers that we're familiar with. So some of the discussion, um, some of the more advanced use cases uh, kind of led us down the path of redefining this header to be a structured field. So if you're only doing a single datagram, it's no different to be honest, but if you're doing more, um, if you go into the next slide, I can give you an example. Uh, Oh, ooh, the my uh, images have changed. But anyway, yeah, it, we we kind of came up with this new definition of a name. I don't want to get too much into it, really, because uh, it's all in the document. Um, and this probably makes it sound more complicated than it is. But uh, we have this concept of list members um, that are flow ID or flow identifier elements that can be named or unnamed. Um, you might need a name if you've got more than one, because it makes it easier to reference which which member you're kind of talking about. It's just a handle for an, one. And if you didn't have names, then things get difficult. And so there's some specific rules here that uh, you know names must not appear more than once in a list because you know they're overlapping, different IDs, different names. That's sad. Uh, and so 
how enforceable these rules are. These aren't part of structured fields. They're effectively additional rules on the top of them. Uh, but it, uh, I mean, from an implementer's hat on, it's fairly straightforward to kind of apply additional validation to this, in my opinion. Maybe we haven't got everything quite right, but I think what we have in there is is pretty OK. So Lucas, I think I might have been the one to suggest this particular structure, but I don't remember ever discussing the name thing. Um, if the name is just an arbitrary parameter type um, on on each structured field integer, how does that turn into something that can be used by someone and how does that not conflict with potential concrete extensions? So one of the things that I imagined we would have here is, okay, so you've got a datagram flow ID for this um, uh, Connect UDP thing and, it, and you've got one particular flow identifier allocated for just the unadorned uh, UDP packets. But um, you also want to have another flow identifier for UDP packets that were ECN marked, if that's the way that you wanted to spell that, for instance. And um, if you just allow people to have arbitrary labels here with names, that's going to conflict potentially with like the names that they can choose can overlap with the labels that you want to use for real parameters that mean something. How do you reconcile that? Uh, that's so can I jump in to answer this, perhaps? Um, Go for it. Thanks. So the, the idea th there was to have a way to, let's say, if you have two separate extensions that want to both have their own flow ID, you want a way to differentiate which is which. So having a name solve, uh, solves that. Um, what we did in the draft is we have an IANA registry for any and all parameters to datagram flow ID. So that's how we ensure that there aren't any collisions between names and regular parameters is through this registry. And then the registry has a column for, is this a name or not? Um, does that answer your question, Martin? I think that makes it worse, but okay. Um, I will open an issue, I think, because I don't see the value of names as opposed to parameters with semantics which is what I think you're, you're mostly along the, at, but as soon as you went into names, you completely lost me. So I'll so, take another read. So, yeah, or, or maybe let, let me try to explain the advantage of this over uh, parameters is that it means that this uh, can be understood. Like you, you, you will receive, like looking at this header, you will understand that there like four different flow ideas going around, even if you've never heard of this name or have never heard of this extension. So it gives you some like cleaner semantics in that way. If, if you wanted a name, why not reserve a parameter called name that has a string value? We could totally do that as well. Um, I have no preference on the color of the bike shed. Yeah, but you have to justify the name thing a little better and I, I need to read the draft now. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, once you've read it, if you can file an issue, I think, I totally think we can improve this for sure. Thank you. Mark, you next. So Martin, uh, so my suggestion, which was to just create a name parameter, um, but I don't think it's a bike shed. Um, the current design is pretty Byzantine in that what you're basically saying is, is that any parameter on these is a name unless it's in this registry over here, in which case it's a parameter and you as implementation have to keep up to date with the registry to make sure you don't collide. Um, uh, no, that's not unnecessarily quite, complicated. Yeah, that's not quite how it works. Uh, the way it works is that the first parameter, uh, if it's a bool that is true, then it becomes the name. Um, but I totally agree that uh, we can name equals is simpler. So let's just do that. That's fine by me. Okay. Yeah, I, I think um, I'd be happy with that too, because it, it means we can cut like that third bullet point there. Um, we can reduce the complexity of that down and avoid future questions asking why we have this Byzantine scheme. So um, either me or David can create an issue to track this and, and get some resolution going forward. Thanks. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, one more, sorry, Lucas, uh, Ben. Oh, that's fine. 
Hey, uh, I don't really understand why you need this restriction that each name can only be used once. Uh, it doesn't seem to be necessary. I mean, I don't. It doesn't seem to be useful to to repeat the same name, which in mask it would result in uh, multiple flows with the same properties. But that also doesn't seem like a problem. I think that's a fair comment. I don't know if I have a response to that right now. Um... We, for at least for some of the the uses, let's say like the ECN uh, Connect UDP extension as currently written, it wouldn't make sense to have multiple of the same name, but we could in this document not say anything about repeating names. And then in the definition of each individual name, that definition can state whether it can be repeated or not. Because in some cases, Ben is right, maybe you might, that might be a useful feature. So I'm, I'm not claiming that it's a useful feature. I'm just claiming that it doesn't actually cause problems. So uh, if this is a sticking point, we can just forget about it. And if somebody actually does it, uh, well, it'll work. It'll be weird, but it'll work. Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, Ecker? Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about some names being repeatable and some names being not. That seems like terrifying and it seems very hard to enforce at this. Like things that are hard to enforce at this layer seem sad. So um, like probably either they should all be repeatable or none of them be repeatable. At least at this layer of the deck. Thank you. Tommy? Just a quick comment on that. I, I think the problem about repeatability probably will go away if we rewrite this to be a truly parameterized list. Um, and for example, in, okay, I, Martin, I was about to say that, that for ECN, you should just have an ECM parameter in which you say, okay, these particular flags fold into this datagram flow. And maybe that one of my datagram flow IDs has ECN with CE marked, and another one also has CE marked, but also with another parameter. So I don't think we should have any restrictions on parameters being repeated across different flow IDs. Um, but individual extensions can say essentially how, how they can be combined for themselves. Thanks, Tommy. That's actually interesting. I'll have to think about it more, see if that works. But uh, like the, the composition of extensions is always a tricky topic. So uh, it, it'll be nice for us to get it right. I'd, I'd uh, to, re to respond quickly, I think part, part of this was to allow us to have uh, effectively named extension points that could have parameters applied to them. Uh, specifically that those parameters might overlap in some way. That, you know, there might be a Q value or something. And we wanted to be able to allow parsers to to be able to disambiguate those things cleanly. Uh, but that said, I think there are very many variations on this design that are possible. Uh, Miriam? Yes, so, um, this proposal assumes, assumes a certain design for extendability, which uh, is that we overload the flow ID to use it to signal different things, right? We could also just like have the flow ID as a flow identifier and then have the ability to add another field or additional fields after the flow ID, which would, would uh, you know, need some more bytes, but might be from a design point more um, clear. So we should not mix up those two decisions. We should first um, figure out how we want to realize extendability and then decide if we actually need to um, assign multiple flow IDs to the same flow. Uh, ben, and then we'll cut the queue. I just wanted to say that having uh, sort of type safe looking parameters on the datagram flow IDs like ECN is potentially a layering violation here and could create some real complexity in the registry structure because datagram flow ID 
has nothing to do with connect UDP. Datagram flow ID is a, a generic HTTP3 mechanism. So uh, I don't know who gets to decide whether ECN is an allowed parameter to have in, in a datagram flow ID, but it might end up mixing layers or requiring all of the uh, different users of datagram flow ID to share a namespace or something. So anyway, uh, I'm sure that um, it started out, but something to consider. So that's solved in my mind today, uh, where this document defines an INA registry for the parameters, and then anyone from a higher layer can add something to that registry. That seemed like the simplest way to solve that problem in my mind. So that's possible. It does create weirdness, right? Now you have, like, hypothetically, you have web transport and mask and whoever else all putting, you know, parameters that don't, that have nothing to do with each other that are like applicable in totally different contexts, having to register them in a, in a single registry. Um, Isn't that true of every single registry IANA keeps? Take like TLS extensions, for example. Some of them are have completely nothing to do with other ones. That's not a layering violation. That's how registries work, right? So some registries end up with things like a column that tells you the scope. Right, where they say like this is the extension, and here's the context in which this actually makes sense, and not all entries in the registry make sense in the same context. Uh, and so that, maybe maybe there's that could be an interesting uh, addition, perhaps. All right, thanks, all. Uh, Lucas. Uh, okay, next slide, uh, which goes through some ECN examples. Um, I, I, I think we don't need to beat around the bush for this fund like some people like that some people hate it that's the, the only thing i think we want to establish is that having one more than one datagram flow id is going to be usable i haven't heard anything um like counter to that so far so ignore the format but keep the capability and and we'll continue to work on this so the next slide Uh, yeah, there's other changes in there, not just that one. The parameter registry, uh, I think, you know, it's going to help conflicts and maybe do some other things. We'll see. Uh, some of it that was inspired by uh, MNOT's, uh, I think, cache status header or some other header with cache in it. There's quite a few. It's confusing. Uh, but yeah, the I think getting to grips with structured fields and future extensibility is something that maybe as a community we'll we'll get some experience with too and ideally try not to reinvent the wheel too much on that and, and go for a common strategy is what I'd like. Um, but the other changes in this draft, the second point there, the possibility of retiring a flow ID and reusing it has been added into the draft. Um, I don't know if you want to speak any more to that, David, but uh, if not, uh, we have some minor things like uh, changing an error code, which shouldn't really change anything. Um, but some more guidance on use with the intermediaries. So I don't want to go into too much of that today. The RFC diffs in the in the thing reviews are going to be good there. Uh, I see a question from Eka. I could take that now. Yeah. Given that we have roughly two to the sixty-two flow IDs, let us not attempt to reuse them. Sorry, can you say that again, Eric? I didn't quite hear you. As they say, more a comment than a question. Um, Given that we have two to the 62 flow IDs, let us not attempt to reuse them. Like the only reason I consider reuse them is because you think it's like sad to like burn three octets on a flow ID instead of when you had some one octet available and that's just not a good enough reason. All right, I'll invite you to follow an issue on the, uh, on the, on the Git repository then please. Actually, we might already have one open, uh, double check. Yeah. I see a plus one for Martin, in, and if my memory serves me, I thought Martin opened that issue, but it, I might be wrong here. Uh, yes, so not, we, I'm be I, opened, I opened the issue because it wasn't very clear in the draft what, what your decision was. Um, and then it quickly rat holed into, oh, well, how can we make this reuse work? Um, which is fun, but at this point is probably best. Point Fair taken. Enough. Uh, so, um, yeah, the next slide. 
so uh, I think the main question here, um, what I'm I'm seeing is still some interest. And so uh, the, the main question is, should the mask working group adopt this document? That's not the question that I can ask. It's for the chairs to do it. But you know, the, the background and the history here is that H3 datagrams are normative dependency of Connect UDP, but it's a document that's still David's individual draft effectively. So as authors, um, we believe that the document captured changes that reflected the discussion. I, I should retcon that and say discussion from IETF up until I made the slides. Um, there's clearly some more future work to do there. Uh, but you know, can we now adopt this document to help solve the paradox and and you know have us actually use the mask forum to to continue to evolve this thing lockstep with Connect UDP? Yeah, thanks, Lucas, um, and thanks for tabling this up. Uh, indeed, now we want to, uh, you know, present a question to the group as to whether or not we think um, uh, it's appropriate to adopt this document uh, in its current state um, as a, you know, to go to work alongside Connect UDP, obviously under the, the condition that all the contents are, you know, subject to change, uh, the formats of the headers, whatever. Um, uh, but before we ask the question, uh, just drain the queue real quick, uh, Martin. Yeah, so in reviewing the Connect UDP draft just now, I noticed that there's um, a potential different design um, that we probably want to discuss. Um, I don't know if it's better or worse, but um, one of the problems with the current design is that you have to decide all of the different flow IDs that you might use in relation to a particular Connect context, whatever that happens, however you want to think about that. When you make the request, you say, all right, I'm going to set this thing up. And then the request, um, the, the header fields will determine which flow IDs that you have. And that doesn't really fit very well with my understanding of how these flow IDs are going to be used in this context. And I'm sort of wondering whether there's a possibility of having frames for that, um, as in using the chunk types that David's defined to, to signal, well, I'm going to now use this datagram to mean, or this datagram flow ID to mean X. Uh, the problem with that is it makes the flow ID relationship to those requests not visible to intermediaries. So I'm not sure that that's necessarily a good idea, but I wanted to float the idea here because it changes the scope of this document. Uh, to, just to, to respond to that, I, I, I think you're asking kind of for a capability that's similar to um, proxy, quick aware proxying will, will get presented later in a, in a sense that you want to, or people might like to be able to decorate an active stream with some additional metadata. Um, and so, you know, a, a way to do that is effectively like a, a patch of the headers um, with some extra headers. You could do that with frames for sure, um, or maybe a another request method, uh, which HP purists might hate. Uh, I think there's a few different ways that this could be done. I do appreciate that people might like the attractiveness of doing that. Yeah, I think there's a number of different ways we could spell this. And frames first chunks is an interesting question as well, and, and headers as well. Um, I don't know that we need to answer that question before adoption, though. I'm just raising it now for people to think about. Yeah, Thanks. thank you, Martin. Uh, Victor? Uh as an editor of a draft that depends on this document, or at least depended on the previous version of this document, uh, this draft keeps getting surprising changes, which I keep learning uh, as, as a complete surprise. And it seems to be getting new and new features. Uh, so I am somewhat concerned about the choice of venue here. Because last time we discussed this, this was supposed to go to HTTP BIS. Um, if, if some, I guess, background. Uh, chairs of the HTTP Quick and Mask Working Group, um, we all sort of convened and chatted about where this might go um, and concluded that here was sort of the best place for it. Um, I mean, I take your comment that the things are changing, uh, perhaps not in the direction you would like. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, if and when this is adopted, we can um, you know get a better handle on that and and then make it maximally useful for all intended use cases. Uh, it's not as it's changing that in the directions I don't like. It's changing in directions I like, and I 
feel like I kept being out of the loop of what is changing, which is seriously concerning given that I'm designing protocols that's based on this. So, yeah. Victor, um, just to respond really quickly, apologies for you feeling that you were out of the loop. Um, I think a big difference is that this document right now is an individual draft. So I was just updating it anytime I had an idea, I would do that. And I apologize for not ch chatting with you more. Uh, however, adopting this here in HTTP this will mean that, you know, changes will now uh, require, you know, consensus and we are going to establish a GitHub, very specific GitHub process for mask as well. So uh, I think what you're asking for is for the document to be adopted, the which venue doesn't really matter that much. Okay. You, you said here in HTTP this, I just want to clarify that. Sorry, Mark, I, you cut out the first part. I didn't hear you. I heard David say the phrase here in HTTP this. Oh, no, that, that, well, that, that, I misspoke then. I meant adopting it here in mask and we have a process in mask. Apologies. Thank you. Just wanted to double check. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it looks like the queue is empty now. So Eric, do you want to attempt the poll feature? <laughs> yeah, we were thinking we'd give WebEx polling a try and if it doesn't work, we'll fall back to chat, but sometimes it's nice if you can click between a set of options rather than type freeform into a rapidly scrolling thing. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna open up a uh, open up a poll with what looks to be two different questions. Uh, one of them is intended to be a uh, did you find the poll? And the other one is the actual question we want to ask, which is the should we or should we not use this document as a starting point for the HTTP3 datagram work in mask. Uh, so especially I think in light of some of the comments that we've seen in this meeting, it seems pretty clear that we're going to have some number of uh, changes that, that the working group is going to want to see to the document. Um, but I think the authors have expressed willingness to, to make those changes and, and find where we're going. So this would be our starting point for those changes. So uh, while everyone fills that out, uh, Mary, did you have a quick question? Uh, yes, I would actually like to see some of these changes first and then have the adoption call. Gotcha. Noted. I think the, the intent here is uh, we're trying to gauge interest in doing that. Um, so this will actually, that adoption call will happen on the list. So I would say that when it goes out to the list, um, but this would probably be a, uh, click no moment for the uh, poll then. Yeah, Ian just asked which which changes particular. I think uh, the the naming part where we had some discussion about it, I think it's just easier if we remove those parts where we have like a lot of disagreement or uncertainty about and then take that as a starting point than having stuff in a in a document and then start the discussion afterwards. Is there anybody who's having trouble finding the poll in WebEx? Looks like most people are fairly done filling it out. But if there's anybody who's stuck, now is the time to holler. Yeah, Martin has a good question. Uh, can you see the results? <laughs> the, 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 the poll results show up on my screen, and I believe I can paste them into the chat. OK, great. Thank uh, Jonathan we'll put them in the jab, in the in the notes. I think Jonathan's in the queue. Uh, yes, Jonathan, go ahead. Uh, I was only going to respond to uh, Miria's point. I would I would suggest that this is not the last uh, discussion you're going to have on this draft. So as long as the general draft is in heading in a good direction, and we think that it's uh, reasonable, it's in a reasonable place where we can discuss and change things in the draft. I, I would support uh, adoption. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm still not sure what I should put in the poll here. Um, because I, I think Eric, you said earlier, uh, the, the editors are committed to do some changes based on the discussion we had today. So all I'm asking for is to see those changes first 
and then have the, the adoption call. I think that totally makes sense. It's just one more revision I'm looking for, not like an well, endless discussion. As editor of the document, uh, I'll say that uh, if today's adoption call is successful, I, I will make changes before re-uploading that, that we've discussed here. That's totally fine, but I would really prefer we not delay this. Uh, like if there's anything in the dash zero zero that you don't like, we will change that. That's perfectly reasonable. Like we don't need the document to be finished before we adopt it. All right. Before we drain the rest of the queue, I'm about to close the poll. So if you haven't clicked buttons that you are planning on clicking or you are partway through clicking the buttons because I made you answer two questions instead of just one, uh, please do so now. I'm about to close it. All right. Ah, we get a little timeout bar. That's new and exciting. Thank you, WebEx. All right, it looks like in 10 seconds it will actually close in. Uh, Ecker, do you have a quick question? Uh, well, not a question, but um, I mean, so so I mean, Miriam's request to make the changes before this is adopted is in order, but I think wrong. Um, namely, that I don't think the changes are that major. And speaking as someone who found some of those things annoying, um, um, I don't think the changes are that major, and I trust the, the, the editors to make them or, the, or, or, or me to complain about them later if I don't think they have. Cool. Thank you. So I just um, want clarity here, right? So like, if, if the changes are made before this is a working document, I would like to see the changes. If we adopt the document as it currently is, that's fine as well. But then that's what we're asking for. I'm just like, don't know what we're asking for. It's as the document currently is. And um, the results of the polls uh, sort of clearly suggest that people are more or less in favor. Um, so at this point, uh, we'll confirm this on the list um, and then uh, Hopefully, move forward. Um, we can see the polling results on our side too. I yeah, hoped I clicked that button, but you never know. Yeah, just one final comment as a, an author slash editor here. Uh, it's just it's probably going to be easier for us to migrate the document into a mask working group repo and then create the issues there for traceability and to make sure everyone's in the loop. Should should we decide as a group to adopt this document? That is a good point. Actually, um, I mean, we don't need to, we can answer this later, but unlike the previous mass documents, this one is in its own repo, so we can transfer it to the mask repo and the issues will come with it. Uh, so yeah, that all that should be pretty easy, but we can, we can take that offline. Yep, I was gonna say, when the time comes, we can just transfer ownership and everything will go along with it. Okay, um, unless there's anything else, I think we can um, move on to the next presentation. Uh, David, you are up. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is David Skenazi, and I'm here to talk about Connect UDP. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, Connect UDP is like Connect, but for UDP. Uh, I've, as you notice, this summary of what it does is getting shorter and shorter. Uh, but really, let's just try to keep this protocol simple. Uh, and the one notable thing is that it can use quick datagram frames uh, to allow not retransmitting your UDP. So next slide, please. I guess this is now a mask tradition. Uh, let's not make this protocol as complex as this uh, set of slides. Next slide, please. So uh, we discussed this earlier. Uh, I'll do better uh, about uh, closing the issues specifically on this uh, document. Uh, sorry about that. Next slide. All right. So this is one of the things that we resolved. Uh, but in particular, I got moved to the datagram draft. But I wanted to highlight it a little bit um, because that is an issue that might uh, in some for some folks warrant more discussion. Um, in the current design, um, the, for, the datagram flow ID header allows one-to-one, uh, one-to-many, -to -one, one and many-to-one mappings between a request and a flow ID. So first off, we need a mapping between a request and a flow ID uh, for lifetimes. So you can, when you create your Connect UDP, um, you know how long that uh, flow ID will be valid. And then on the 
server, you know, that tells you when you get the UDP payload for that flow ID, which uh, target server you want to send it to. Um, the feature of doing one to many is an extension point that allows, in some cases, to on one request uh, open up multiple flow IDs in order to uh, save bytes. So let's take ECN, for example. Um, ECN, you could implement by having an extension that says, well, the right before the UDP payload, um, we just add one byte that contains the ECN bits. Um, that would totally work. Uh, another way would be to allocate multiple flow IDs, one for each um, ECN um, state, one of the four, and then you kind of save that byte. Uh, I think for ECN, it really doesn't make much of a difference, but there are some other extensions where this could be particularly really useful. Let's say if you want to do you know, other kinds of compression or things. So I think that would be, that would be useful. Uh, and the many to one is a case where you want to have multiple Connect UDP requests that end up sharing a flow ID. And this is used in the quick proxying extension that Tommy will be presenting later. So just wanted to kind of highlight that having this list in the um, in the datagram flow ID enables this. But um, yeah, so that was issue 16. Uh, just jump in the queue if you want to chat about these individual issues. Otherwise, I'll just move forward. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. So the problem with many to one is that it's going to be very difficult for intermediaries that route different requests to different locations to manage that. Um, I don't have in the top of my head the way that the quick proxy extension uses this. But if you imagine the case where you have an intermediary, um, say a gateway that's, that's taking requests and forwarding them to different backends and expecting those backends to, to manage those, one of the ways you might imagine this working is the intermediary just looks at the Connect UDP and says, OK, I'm going I'm to forward this and do whatever rewriting necessary to get the, the, the flow IDs working between the different endpoints. And that's all I have to worry about. But at the point where it has to make sure that different requests go to the same backends based on where it sent them previously, that gets really interesting. And I'm not sure that this is properly justified. So in like, you're totally right that there's a concern there. The document states that, yeah, if, if you use this uh, many to one, you need to ensure that like the intermediary needs to ensure that it lands on the same back end. Um, I would rather we didn't like focus on intermediaries because like we, we want them to work, absolutely. But uh, like, I think that most deployments of this will not be using intermediaries. And so I, I would be sad to lose a feature that an extension is using just because it makes implementing an intermediary harder. You could say, if you, if you wanna use this feature, don't, like don't use intermediaries or figure out a way to make your intermediary work with us, which is possible if uh, I'll be a little tricky. It's a, it's an HTTP method. And I think we have to work within the HTTP architecture, unfortunately, and that, that suggests that this would be difficult if not impossible. So I think I would like better justification for this one. Do you have that at hand? Or maybe so I, the, I should just go digging. Um, I mean, the. Uh, how about we wait for Tommy's presentation because I think he'll he'll explain it better than a thirty second okay. overview I would do now. Fair enough. Yep. Uh, cool. Uh, Alex, Alex is next. Uh, I wanted to echo some confusion slash concern about the many to one case. Um, having done some sort of similar implementation work when we were building our, our VPN on top of Quick. Um, we actually found that the many to one thing kind of breaks horribly in ways that you don't expect. Um, and while I can definitely see a justification for the one to one and one to many use cases, I am nervous about the many to one and look forward to Lucas's presentation later on to see how it's used. Cool. That that makes sense. Uh, if yeah, and, and this is something we might. Uh, end up uh, removing. That's totally reasonable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, oh yeah, sorry. So here's another one that uh, we, so initially uh, we didn't have a scheme in Connect UDP because uh, the first draft of Connect UDP like was very similar to Connect. Uh, however, um, scheme is required uh, according to the HTTP semantics documents. And the exception for connect does not apply to any new methods. So we don't get that um, that exception for connect UDP, unfortunately. Uh, that said, the, uh, the scheme, even though it needs to be carried, really doesn't provide us with any useful information. Uh, like, you know, from the HTTP method, what you need to do, like the scheme isn't useful and probably won't be used anywhere. So in the in the draft, I had initially said, well, let's use a mask scheme because I thought that looked cool. And everyone told me that uh, it's a huge amount of work to define a URL scheme. Uh, and so I thought, well, how about we just use HTTPS? Um, is there any reason not to? So I'd like to pause here and let folks comment. Uh, Mark? I'm curious to know why anyone thinks it's a huge amount of work to define a new URL scheme, or, or more properly, URI scheme. Um, it's not. Uh, OK, I think you were one of the ones to say that, but um, <laughs> nope. Yeah. All right, never mind. Uh, but do you have like do you have thoughts on using HTTPS here, since you're here, um, Mark? I think it's possible. I mean, the mental model that I'm using is that, yes, in theory, people have occasionally used HTTPS URIs as a means of proxy configuration uh, to connect, you know, for, for normal connect. Um, but that hasn't been very uniform practice. I think some clients expect to host port pair, other ones want a URI. Um, so, I, I I would lean towards a distinguished URI that, that has the semantics that you want it to have, whatever those semantics happen to be, um, rather than overloading HTTPS. Because then you need contextual information to say, well, this HTTPS URI is meant for that purpose, which is fine. But if, if you want to load that information into the URI, then having distinguished scheme might be nice to have. So just to make sure I understand, you would be say, are you asking about a URI to configure the proxy? Meaning, for example, in my web browser, I open a page and I type a URI and the browser then knows which proxy to talk to? If you want to give someone a URI and have them know that that's a URI for using Connect UDP to a particular endpoint to, it's useful to have a URI scheme. If that's not a use case that's interesting to you, then HTTPS is perfectly fine. So, no, no, no. I, I think that use case is interesting, but I'm trying to tease apart two things. Mm -hmm. I think uh, having a URI for proxy configuration might be useful, um, but it's not the same thing as what we send over the wire in order to talk through a proxy to create a Connect UDP tunnel. And what I mean by that is, um, you could have your, let's say, proxy colon slash slash or connect colon mm -hmm. slash slash, mm -hmm. uh, the, where right after that second slash, you would put the host name of your proxy. Whereas in this case here, we're not configuring a proxy. We're just the host name there is the host name of the target server. Yes. So I would be inclined to say, let's to use HTTPS here and to potentially later mm -hmm. in a separate document define a, a URI for configuring proxies, because I think sure. that could be useful. Um, in in that the protocol you're speaking to that, all right, then, I, then I'm going to shift the goalpost a little bit, I suppose. Um, I, I, I see what you're saying. I think that one argument that you could make is, is that HTTPS is appropriate because we're using HTTP3 or falling back to non-HTTP3. Um, and, and that seems reasonable. If you want to... Hmm. I was thinking that if you wanted to note that that you really want it to have, you know, the datagram extension and to use Connect UDP in that interaction, that would be useful. But that information is kind of already present to some degree uh, in the method. So, yeah, I think HTTPS is actually fine. 
on the wire. Yeah, I'll retract that. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Eckers next, and we'll cut the queue here. I mean, after Tommy, we'll cut the queue after Tommy. So, I mean, my my natural question, which um, I'm being informed offline, is has a long answer: is why can't we just add an exception for connect UDP rather than like inventing a scheme that doesn't correspond to anything meaningful? Um, with that said, um, so perhaps someone will say to me at some other point or point me to where it's been when explained. Um, um, the uh, um, uh, with that said, I mean, the, 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 the semantics of this scheme in this case are not that I want to do HTTPS to the server. It's that I want you to send UDP packets to the server. And so from, um, so from that perspective, um, you know, um, uh, it's, I think it's quite odd to use HTTPS in this case. And, and, and actually, at some level, the, the UDP seemed to make more sense, even though I think I was against it in the, in the past. Um, uh, one might ask a separate question, which is if the for some reason the exception is hard to extend, perhaps it was an error to use a separate verb, and we should simply simply create a an, a new header on connect that in, indicates that we want to connect over UDP rather than TCP, which would then let us not have to do this little goofy dance. So just to add a little bit of context, uh, the reason we uh, created a new verb and didn't reuse connect is because of the behavior we want when this is not supported. So let's say if you talk to a proxy and you tell it, I want to talk UDP to this uh, you know, WebRTC server or what have you, um, you don't want that to fall back to TCP, which is what you would get by adding a header on connect. Well, I'm, I'm, aware, I'm aware of that issue, um, but it seems to me that that issue is actually relatively modest. Um, you can certainly have a confirmatory header which says I did connect UDP, and if that doesn't come back, it's an error. As a practical matter, you don't one does not connect to random proxies and think perhaps they have UDP and perhaps they do not have UDP. One is configured with them, and so it should be configured correctly. And so whether you get the error in one round trip or um, two round trips does not seem very significant. That's, uh, Magnus? that's a reasonable pr proposal. Yes. <clears throat> so Magnus Westlund here. Um, um, I I don't know about this semantics. I, I brought up the question, and I think the reasons maybe to have is that separate external reference casing use this masks proxy to do something. And, and that's possibly separate document. The other aspect I was caring a bit about here is the relation between the different semantics and and if we would define a schema because we need to think about okay we have udp we have we are thinking about ip there might be future other protocols in the future that fits into this so i think that needs to be to say how is that handled inside that if we're doing it and does it affect the inside mask protocol usage of this uh, uri That was my comment. So okay, I think thanks, uh, Martin. I think in this case, a, a new URI scheme, scheme is actually a little harder than Mark implied because I think we have to ask questions like what Magnus was getting at here in terms of um, what information the URI expresses and how we manage extensibility and all, all those sorts of questions. Having looked at the existing UDP URI schemes, they differ in some of the things that they do. Um, and so that's problematic. Um, I would say the other thing is that uh, we're looking here for a, a means rather than an ends. So having a URI scheme might be valuable in the sense that you can have some configuration that express things just as a single string. But primarily, this is just a, a, a step on the path to getting to something else. You're, you're achieving some other ends. And so um, I, I think it's perfectly fine for us to use HTTPS because we're really just looking for a different way to spell the exception that, that Echo was seeking. And I, that the spelling is not that bad. I mean, it's a little bit ugly, but I think I could probably live with that. David, do you want to reply to that? I'm, uh, I mean, MT says he agrees with me, and so he's right. Um, so no, uh, no, no, I mean, I, so I, and, and to kind of, sorry, I didn't really reply to Magnus at the time. I, I agree that, like, at the end of the day, we're, like, 
we're trying to bend things just to accomplish, like we all agree on what we want to accomplish. And my personal take is going with simplicity to just do this. And if we want to have a URL for configuration, that's going to be a lot more like tr tr tricky questions to answer. Uh, and I think that would be useful, but um, that's also out of scope of this working group. Our charter explicitly says, states that we're currently not chartered to do discovery of proxies. And so the URL that allows you to find the proxy is something that I would be interested in working on at some point, but it's currently out of charter. So I wouldn't open that bag of worms right now. Okay, Tommy, and then that's it. Thank you. Um, so HTTPS, I think, is generally going to be the right thing to do, definitely more than having a new URI scheme. However, I, I think there's I have a crazy proposal of saying, you know, we don't need to define one scheme here. Like, why can't we just essentially use the scheme of what the actual request is trying to access? So generally, I think... You know, we are thinking about how am I proxying quick? How am I proxying HTTP three over HTTP three? In those cases, and maybe we even encourage kind of by default, say yes, use HTTPS because you're literally connecting to HTTPS through this thing using Connect UDP. However, if you had another URI scheme that accurately represented the thing you are connecting to on the other side of the target, let's say it's a I don't know, you're doing DNS over quick and you're using the DNS URI scheme and you want to indicate that, yes, I am connecting to a DNS over quick server using Connect UDP. Use that because actually that allows us to, um, like, you know, we may want to talk about what is the actual DNS resolution that's happening on the proxy. And, you know, it's going to issue a quad A queries. Maybe it's going to issue some SVCB queries. And actually knowing what scheme it has, the thing it's trying to request is potentially useful. And so like, we can just say, yes, do HTTPS in general, but it doesn't have to be only HTTPS. Like let the scheme field actually be somewhat useful in case someone wants to use it later in the Connect UDP. So just to clarify what you're saying, Tommy, would you be okay with saying the, the, the document says, you must use HTTPS and you must ignore on receipt. And then later someone can have other semantics because there are mm. a lot of use uses that don't have a scheme, right? If I have my custom Busco protocol over UDP, it probably doesn't have a URI scheme. Sure, I, I guess, and I, I see Martin's comment, like, yeah, you don't want to tell the proxy what you're planning to do. That That's fine, you don't have to do it. Just do HTTPS by default. I just, I think we could get away with saying you should send HTTPS but it doesn't need to be a must. Like we can say that by default, you ignore it on receipt, but I don't see why we need to mandate it as a must if we don't actually care what it is right now. Just recommend that it is HTTPS unless there's reason to do otherwise. I, that, that works for me either way. Um, so there was a, a sort of late breaking comment in Jabber. Uh, Lucas, can you relay that real quick? Uh, sorry, but sorry to Ben here. I missed the original thing and, and we had a bit of a race condition go on. So I'll keep it quick. Ben said, Ben Schwartz said, using HTTPS would require updating the definition of the HTTPS URI scheme since the destination does not support HTTPS. Using UDP seems much better to me. Another option might be null if it can't be empty and isn't meaningful. And by null, that means the string null uh, for the scheme, not just empty. I don't think that Ben is right in that this would require changing the definition of HTTPS. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, let's take this to the uh, issue and uh, move on to the to the next uh Ah, sorry, take this to the issue and we can move on to the next slide about another issue. Uh, yeah, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I was just gonna say Mark has, was in the, or he tried to queue up, but the queue's cut. So Mark, if you could just leave a, a comment on the issue, that would be great.
All right, so the uh, stream format, as in, so connect UDP uh, is an HTTP request. Uh, so it has a bidirectional stream attached to it. Um, and once the headers are sent, uh, you, we can use things for it. So in connect, that's just the direct byte stream that is being shoveled over TCP. Uh, in this case, we need a way to mark the delay limited limitation between uh, UDP packets. Um, and so you need length value and why not make it extensible and therefore make it TLVs? So that's what it is right now. It's a sequence of TLVs uh, where type zero is the only one that's registered in the document. And it means here is a UDP payload and we can uh, like have a, an IANA registry and extensions can use these, um, like define new, new types of chunks. Um, to clarify how this is sent in HTTP3, the stream is sent over data frames. Uh, similarly in HTTP2, this is sent over data frames and in HTTP11, it's directly over TLS or TCP. Um, so that's it for that one. Um, the yeah, apologies for when the first time I wrote it, I did an absolutely terrible job and it was very confusing. I hope that it's more readable now. Um, though I saw an, error, an issue from Martin that made me think that maybe I need to clarify the text even further. But uh, does this sound reasonable to folks? Ecker has uh, a question or comment. So I think it sounds reasonable, but I guess I'm now a little puzzled by the previous discussion about flow IDs and ECNs, as this seems like a relatively natural way to convey ECN information as well, um, in that one could simply be like type of one is like UDP payload with ECN or some, some, some such thing, right? Um, or UC, UDP payload metadata. So like, like I, I guess I do agree it's like not like super helpful to like have, um, you know, I guess my point is like this, that, that like, it seems like either one ought to have, one ought to have in the concept we're gonna have a type field here, or um, we ought to have a concept that we're going to have a type field exterior in the flow ID, but having them in both places seems a little goofy. And you know, the, uh, understanding Martin Thompson's why not both. Um, so um, I, I guess it seems like we should try to understand if if we want to have like data which is collinear with UDP datagrams, but but it has different semantics. Where do we think we should indicate that? And I would say once, and I would say here. So there are two things. Um, so the ECN extension actually does this. So it defines three new uh, three new types. Um, but uh, we for uh, connect UDP with ECN over HTTP three, you want to be able to send your ECN over datagrams or over streams. Um, I mean, for HTTP three over streams isn't particularly useful, but that is more useful for HTTP two. And so no matter what, you're gonna need two ways of encoding this data, one over the stream and one over the datagram. And then you, both of these need to be extensible. I like the idea of having only one mechanism that does both, but I couldn't come up with one that was uh, nice um, apart from if we just add the type at the start of uh, after the flow ID, but that's just feels kind of wasteful to me. So that's why they're currently separate. Okay, um, uh, I do see the concern you're trying to operate under. I'm not sure I agree with the answer, but let me go think about it some more rather than like debating it here. Cool, and uh, please uh, let's let's chat more because I, I would love to find a, a solution that, that looks cleaner. Uh, Magnus? Yes, I think this last comment really changed my views a bit here because I thought, I mean, I think this type of mechanism is needed not only for the reliable streams, but also for the datagram because that hack on the flow IDs, I don't think work particularly well when we get past a few bytes of additional data that we need to transfer. And I think we are in some of these extensions going to have a bit more than one byte to uh, that's the thing goes in a reasonable amount and combinatorial nicely into flow IDs. So I do think this is needed and I think it should be used both in the data grabs and in the, uh, in the streams. So for, um, for the, um, 
data datagrams, I, I'm not saying that all extensions must use multiple flow IDs. Like I, I personally believe that that would be a useful feature, but for some extensions, like I was saying in that email, if for example, you want to record like the timestamp of when that UDP packet got received by the proxy, uh, you could have a flow ID that means timestamp followed by UDP payload. And I totally agree with you. If yeah. that timestamp is like 32 bits, you don't want to encode that in the flow ID. That would use a lot of flow IDs. Um, but I, I think it, it would be useful to have both options personally. That type is fine. I think, okay, encoding the uh, stream chunk type into the flow ID, that's, that's one thing. I've, uh, and to shorten its format, I think it's the need for having multiple different types and that that types definitions need to be the same in both places. That's really neat. So uh, I think you're in the right direction here at least. Thank you. Uh, uh, Tommy? Tommy? Uh, I'd actually like to go kind of the opposite direction. I mean, still in the effort to simplify, but I think we could probably do without having a chunk type registry here. You know, if we want to, for things like ECN, have the type not being coded as different flow IDs, but instead being coded as a field that always comes directly after, that's fine. But I mean, could we not essentially just have the datagram flow ID number space be the same as these chunk types here? And essentially, yeah, you're potentially encoding a, a flow ID on this particular stream that is uh, over specific in a number, but it still matches the number like in your connect UDP request header. So, so wait, I, I'm confused now because right now flow IDs are, they're ephemeral. Like you can have two separate connect UDP right. requests at the same time, yep. uh, multiplexed. And if you're saying to replace that with the type, that won't work because you won't be able to demultiplex them. No, no, no. The other way to replace the type with the flow ID. Like when you need to fall back to running this over a stream, if you already have a mechanism in the headers to define flow IDs, just use those flow IDs such that if you want to have two different flow IDs for this one connect UDP request, just use those IDs as the identifiers of your chunks. And don't have oh, that that might actually work and that is cleaner uh i'll think about it some more but i, I really like that idea cool uh all right um next slide um the chairs are telling me that we're running well on time so i'm gonna go faster for these but uh like i, I had put the more important ones up front so intermediaries um a lot of this uh has been Resol like resolved by moving text to the uh, HTTP3 datagram. Conceptually, datagram flow ID is a per hop um, or a hop by hop rather uh, header. But what it means here is that you just require a setting and each intermediary must parse this properly. And every usage of this flow ID, oh, sorry, of this datagram flow ID header needs to specify how an intermediary processes it. So. That's written in the HP datagram doc and connect UDP has an intermediary section to explain what intermediaries are supposed to do. And so does the ECN extension. Um, uh, Martin, quick question. Yeah, as a, as a header field, if it appears on a get request, is the intermediary required to do anything with it? Uh, the intermediary is supposed, uh, so must, uh parse it and if it's on a request that it doesn't understand it must remove it and forget i didn't really specify but i would say it would just the intermediary would remove this header okay so if it if it understands that the if it doesn't understand the the application of the header to the method then it removes it okay uh yes that's a better way to phrase it i'll update the text to say it like that but that was the intent okay all right, thank you. Next slide. Uh, so 
we added a performance considerations section, uh, which uh, added uh, some, um, so no, nothing, no musts, but, or, or actually maybe a couple, uh, but mainly uh, advice on uh, what to do about uh, congestion control, loss recovery, and pacing and all that. So please give it a look and let me know, let us know what you think. And if you think things should be added or things aren't great, please follow issues. Uh, next slide. Uh, ah, yes, uh, so we discussed this at 109. Um, so C connect has this property where it waits for the SYNAC from the target server before it proxies anything. We can't do that with UDP. Uh, in practice, do we actually care? Because uh, no one's gonna DOS uh, your website on port 81. They're gonna DOS you on port 80, so you're gonna send a SYNAC. And so I, uh, I added some text to the uh, security considerations to like mention this issue, but I don't think there's any anything really we can do because of the way UDP works. And next slide, please. And that's it. Um, any more general questions, comments uh, before we move on? All right. Uh, oh, Ian, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the hot path header question. Um, do do we think that's OK? Um, I heard a lot of objections in the past to hot path headers, and, and they're like, so, so, so there it, it, it's from the water working group about that. Uh, so, so it's not technically a hop by hop header. Like hop by hop headers were exist in HTTP one, and they were removed in HTTP two and later. Where there, they specifically you exchange a setting using HTTP two or three to do this, and that's what this document does. So, I think we're very much in line with what you're supposed to do. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll reread the doc and then provide more comments later. Thanks, because you were right. Initially, I had said hop by hop, and people pointed out that that's not how it works in HTTP 2 and later. So I think that's been addressed and fixed. All right, thanks everyone for your time, and I'll hand it over to Alex. Uh, hello, everyone. I will try to go quickly to uh, leave time for the as time permits presentations. Uh, so as a result, we're not going to do a lot of uh, review. So I hope you remember what we discussed in 109. Um, we're mostly going to be talking about the uh, updates and GitHub issue discussion that we had for the IP proxy requirements. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, these are, I think, mostly in issue order. Um, so there was an issue around um, IP addressing where there was some confusion around why a server was required to be able to get an IP in a client provided range. Um, this seems to have been uh, some confused text which has been removed and it has been clarified that uh, the server may do so um, if for some reason the server needs this capability, the client might decline to do so. Um, an example use case for this is if the client wanted to make some resource available to the server and the sole reason that it was connecting to the server was to make that exposure rather than sort of the other way around. Um, in our general terminology, uh, clients and servers can potentially uh, have equal privilege. The only re difference between them is really um, who initiates the connection versus who actually receives it. Uh, so just because you are the client does not necessarily mean you are less privileged on the server. You might be able to provide access to your own network. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, quickly, Alex, there's a question from Miria. Oh, apologies. Yeah, just uh, quickly, you now um, reorganize the requirements based on what should be part of the core document and what can be an extension. So why should that be part of the core document and cannot be an extension? Um, I feel like that question doesn't make sense to me because asking why IP addressing is a uh, cannot be an extension implies that uh, the entire IP addressing section of this document would have to be an extension, if I'm understanding correctly. Which I, I feel like would basically gut this document substantially. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm probably still not understanding what the exact requirement is here. Uh, fundamentally, if we if we look at this at a high level, we're saying that the protocol needs to provide some mechanisms, which can also be further extended in some ways, to provide information between the client and the server around which IPs uh, are usable and reachable um, for both ends of this connection. Um, OK, that, that, yeah, that does make sense. It's not quite what I've been reading, but maybe it's me. I, OK, thank you. Um, another issue uh, there, I think there was some text in the document around OAuth that made it seem like we had to do authorization exclusively through OAuth. Um, that was unintended. Uh, I've clarified in the text that OAuth is merely an example of an authentication or authorization mechanism. Next slide, please. Um, load balancing. So uh, actually, I think these slides are no longer correct because we've made uh, some changes since these slides were put together. Uh, my apologies for the slides being out of date. Um, Previously, uh, we had moved the load balancing section in, into extensions, but later on, uh, as I was discussing with uh, David Skenazi, we actually realized that the entire load balancing requirement is actually the wrong thing that we wanted to convey. Um, we actually believe that it can be purely implemented as an extension and, and as a result, it doesn't need to be in the core document, but rather um, we did introduce a new requirement that we think actually more appropriately conveys what we wanted uh, to share, which is rather we would like to encourage uh, the core mass protocol and IP proxying in particular to be as stateless as possible. It should be it should be simple and straightforward to operate a mask uh, client or server correctly without having uh, a lot of state, which in turn will help improve our ability to do things such as load balance extensions and also um, uh, improve the availability of these connections. Um, as part of this, we did in fact cr uh, create an explicit extension section and we did move some things there. Uh, we removed some language around multi-threading. Uh, this was discussed uh, at length at 109 and was unnecessary. Um, I believe also this whole bit around multi-session load balancing was no longer in the latest version of uh, GitHub as well since we've removed the load balancing section. There's a comment from Maria. Yes, once again, yeah, thank you for, I think that's, that's, um, the requirement is on a better level there now, but I'm um, also want to discuss further if, if we actually want this requirement. I think it's a general, it's a good design to have as little state as possible, but I don't think, I don't know if that's an important requirement compared to other requirements, which actually enable certain functionality. So I think more discussion is needed here. I, I mostly, uh, what we would like to encourage is for folks to think about the state requirements that they are imposing. We're not saying that state is bad and you must always avoid it. Merely, please have explicit considerations about the state that's being introduced. Okay, that's fine. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, we also addressed some text around packet formats. Um, previously, the text said that packets must be sent in their unmodified entirety, uh, which if taken literally would actually preclude any extensions that could do something like compression. Um, this was not the intent. Um, we have loosened the text to say that the transport must be capable of forwarding unmodified packets, but extensions uh, can and may add additional features such as compression. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, no. You're gonna ask a <laughs> sorry, yes, I keep <laughs> I keep coming back. Um, I'm still not sure if I if I fully agree, right? Uh, so I, I, I'm, we might well up end up with a solution where we have a, a possibility to modify um, to forward unmodified packets, but we might well you know have like a simple thing where like for example the proxy already knows the IP address of the target server, so that's a field that you could just easily remove without any additional signaling or whatever. So if we want to do that, we can just do that. I just don't think that like we have to require this at this point. Uh, but that's a very different thing than what the text currently says. So, so what you're basically saying is uh, it is possible for re some redundant information to be removed in cases where you have an individual IP as a target, which I agree with. And, uh, and that I think can and should be implemented as an extension. However, since the protocol, we do explicitly want to be able to transport more than just individual IP addresses. Um, imagine a use case where a client has uh, multiple IPv6 privacy addresses, for example, that it wants to be able to use concurrently. Uh, so I'm just know. arguing the other way around. I think that can be an extension, right? That's the point here. Uh, I think that going in the direction 
of one IP to many IPs as an extension is uh, trying to add additional capability uh, into a lacking extension point rather than the other way around. Merely right now, the requirement is that the tr data transport be capable of doing so. It does not say that uh, uh, packets must be. So I'm sort of uh, sort of wondering what you feel about this requirement that's precluding you from uh, being able to implement uh, the, the use case that you were describing. It, so, um, if I may quickly sure. jump in uh, as, as co-author, um, just ha having designed and implemented uh, IP compression before myself, uh, I've noticed that systems that start with non-compressed and then optionally compress work much better than systems that start compressing and then re-add the, the data. Because a lot of compression techniques will, you know, if you get handed a packet that you didn't really expect, you will fail to compress. And so we, I, I really think that we'll have a better, more robust design if we say that by default, you just send things like that. And then extensions will be critical to make this performant in practice, but they can, they can be just that. And, and one thing which yeah. I would like to add as well is that uh, as we discuss this more, um, I am coming to the opinion that we will likely have to also write a document of effectively mandatory to implement extensions for this thing to be useful in many reasonable scenarios. And I actually personally think that that's an okay outcome. So um, the point is that I'm just coming from the other direction. I'm looking at um, Connect UDP, and I think the thing that we need to add in addition to Connect UDP is very minor to actually make IP proxying work. Right, and in that point, you kind of come from something where we don't have an IP header at all, and you just add a few information. And all I'm saying here is not that we have to decide on a solution right now. It's just like I think the requirement is too strong here because it's there's no good reason to have this requirement in that strong form for for anything we want to support because everything we want to support can also be done in extension on both sides. Uh, could could you help me understand uh, why you think that? Because uh, as I understand Connect UDP today. Um, I could put an entire IP frame into Connect UDP, and like it will get delivered correctly. Mm. The server won't know what to do with it. Like I feel like a, a, a hypothetical Connect UDP implementation would actually satisfy this requirement. But data transport there, which is um, datagram frames, is capable of forwarding unmodified packets. Let, let's move to the to the next in the queue. Um, it sounds like the change that has been made takes a strict requirement and makes it a little bit looser. And if I understand, Mary, you're arguing that it would should be even looser than that. Um, so let, let's let's take that on onto the issue and 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 uh, go back and forth until we figure out where, where to dial that in. Uh, but I'd like to get through the rest of the queue, which would be Magnus next. Yes, so Magnus here. Um, isn't I think I get stuck on this must be forward in their unmodified entirety. Isn't the the requirement is to be able to forward an IP packet or take an incoming IP packet and, and be able to deliver it uh, transparently in the other end. Isn't that the requirement here? Um, I'm not sure I understand the distinction. Uh, this is, you're stating that all fields always need to be included somewhere, all the bytes of this, this full IP packet needs to be included in forwarded. Uh, what I'm saying is that all the information that came into the uh, in entry uh, must be still there when it exits on the other end. Uh, I, I explicitly believe the requirement needs to be that you should be able to take an IP packet byte for byte and make it appear on the other side. Yes. Okay. But then I think, I mean, but, uh, to clarify, that, but being he... able to do so and having that be the operating mode, which is in use are, are different things. Um, I do not expect everyone to uh, use that particular operating mode. This is intended to be a requirement on the capability of the data transport, not not uh, a statement as to whether or not that is how all implementers will use the system. No, but okay, but I, I think that would loosen up this requirement into something which isn't implying how you solve it at this stage. It's just saying this is that we can ensure that we have all the feeds capable moving from client to proxy and the uh, proxy to client. Uh, I, I think I see where you're coming from. Uh, I personally feel that the easiest way to do so is to use the existing mechanisms in the um, IP header that already exists. But uh, I believe since you already have a draft that you presented, we can continue that discussion on the mailing list. Yeah, that would be useful. Um, uh, let's move on to the next person in the queue, Ecker. 
Great. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, so I mostly, I think, joined to, to say what, uh, what what Magnus said. Um, I mean, so like literally speaking, this like is like impossible because we're encrypting the data. <laughs> and so like obviously it cannot be like passed, like like the data that you receive cannot be the unmodified data that you transmit at the, at the other end. So like now we're just like arguing about like exactly what transformations are like happened like between like the, 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 the in, in, in ingress and egress. And it seems to me that the requirement here, um, as, as Magnus said, is that the, 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 the system has to deliver you like an ingress point that allows you to shove an IP in, in and that comes at the other end of the egress point. And that happens in some unspecified fashion um, that, that with this document has nothing to say about. And um, so I think that's the, that, I think, so I think like if everyone agrees that's what we're trying to accomplish, then like the right thing to do is to like try to rewrite the text to, 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 um, to say that. Um, but like, that, I think that, that, that explicitly like rules out questions of compression because the question of compression is like an implementation question of like how that, like how, how the doodad in the middle, like takes care of like taking the packet in and moving the packet out again. Right. Um, and so, um, uh, and so, so I think that, I think the process, if we, if we, if, we, if the intent is merely that, then like this probably needs a little bit of a rewrite, which I think either Magnus or I can contribute. If the intent is something else that you actually want to say that like, no, this protocol is not allowed to compress the data. Then I think it's you got a real problem because, like, like how you how you say it can compress it, but it can't encrypt it. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, thank you, Eckhart. The the intent is to allow extensions. Um, so I think I would very much welcome a PR uh, that attempts to wordsmith this into a form which makes more sense to people. Okay, but I guess I, I guess my point is I don't think like I don't think compression is an extension. I think compression it might be an extension, but it might not be right. I mean, like it's like like. Like we might we like have we design the protocol and say actually like we should like add like compression in here and like why why if, if this document is trying to rule out I, I don't think we I don't think we should do that by the way but if this document is trying to rule that out I think is an inappropriate use of requirements documents. I, um, I, I, I'm sorry I, I'm I'm getting very confused here because I I feel like you just said the opposite of what you just uh, were saying a, a moment ago. Um, we, we okay, so, so like there's like there's like compression between like the data comes in, it's a complete IP datagram. It comes out the other side, it's like a complete IP datagram, right? Whatever happens in the middle is like a secret, right? From the requirements document perspective. I'm sorry, let's take this offline. I'm I'm having okay. a very hard time following and we're okay. on time. Sure. Okay. Uh terminology, uh Miria pointed out that there was one use of the term IP proxying session. Uh, we removed that use. It was not intended. Uh, next slide. Is there anything else? Uh, right. Open issues. Um, next slide, please. Uh, there, are there are two issues that we did not touch on and we do not have text for. Um, one is issue number 12 around whether or not NAT is part of the uh, core protocol or is an extension. We do not have consensus on that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there was also a request to add some more cross-referencing in the document. Uh, I intentionally am intending to do so after we have finished the major edits of the document. I don't want to go through and change next later. And uh, the rest of the slides here were mostly diagrams. If we needed them, I don't think we need them. So if we could please skip to the end and uh, I'll take any questions that have not been already asked. And if not, we will hand over back to the chairs. All right, uh, if there's no other questions, uh, we can move on to the next presentation. Uh, I believe that's Tommy. Yep. So we've got about five or six minutes each for these two, it looks like. That sounds good. I'll, I'll just do a brief kind of introduction so that people kind of understand some of the context for the comments we were having earlier. So this is about our draft uh, that David and I wrote for Extending connected UDP to have some more quick aware optimizations. Next slide, please. Um, so by default, connected UDP lets you proxy any UDP packet within your HTTP connection. And so this implicitly does support proxying quick, but there are some additional things that you could take advantage of um, based on quick specifically that a proxy may want to do to optimize its behavior. The first of those is being able to reuse essentially the UDP socket from the proxy to the target origin. Um, so it's essentially using fewer local ports on that. And then also 
if you want to, you can uh, reduce some of the overhead of the proxy by being able to forward the quick packets without doing double encapsulation and double encryption there. This is not always what you would want to do, certainly, but um, in certain use cases, especially if you are doing kind of multiple hops of proxying, it can cut down on a lot of packaging overhead. Next slide. So this is just a diagram to show how things normally work. If I'm talking to an H3 server through a massive proxy, I have my two different client flows. They're both talking to the same place, but they require two separate uh, UDP sockets essentially between the proxy and the HTTP3 server. Next slide. So with uh, this extension, um, if you are communicating the quick connection IDs that you're using, it then becomes possible to use a single UDP socket between the mask proxy and the HTTP3 server. Next slide. And then you can also, in a forwarded mode, once you have done your handshakes, um, you could also end up sending a packet uh, directly from the client to the proxy that gets forwarded along that same socket without having to be re-encrypted or recapsulated. And it'll have the same quick wire image that you would have talking to the mask proxy to begin with. Next slide. Um, so essentially the main change here is that you're adding a client connection ID header to your initial connect UDP request to let the server know a particular mapping here. Um, the proxy can reject that if it wants to, um, if it doesn't allow this mode or doesn't allow that mapping. Um, also, one thing that we specify in here, which probably could just fold into the main connect UDP document is the fact that um, talking about how you can send your datagram frames kind of along with your first request to make sure that it's very fast on opening. And then for the forwarding mode, you also need to define a server connection ID um, that, that is once you've learned the connection ID that the other side is um, going to be receiving packets on, um, that you also inform the proxy of that. So essentially the proxy is aware of the quick connection IDs in both directions. Um, this is a use case for having one datagram flow ID that is referenced by multiple uh, connect UDP requests, since you can have one datagram flow ID from the client to the proxy that can define multiple connection ID mappings. Of course, we could decide to use multiple flow IDs if that was what people wanted to do. Next slide. So on the proxy, there is a bit more state that has to be maintained here, essentially mapping the connection IDs that are being used for quick connections to UDP sockets. Um, this is essentially extending the state that you already have to map for your quick connections from clients into your outbound sockets. Um, Yep, yeah, and as this is defined, um, the mappings are all defined based on a client request and the server, the proxy server can reject any of them if it doesn't want to handle that type of mapping. And both, of the, both the client and the proxy independently have the option not to do the forwarding mode, not to do any of these modes. Um, it's very much negotiated. Next slide. So I can kind of bounce through these very quickly. Um, but you can see them for future reference. This is just kind of describing the different pieces of state you need to be able to have on the proxy. Um, if you, so already kind of by default, a connect UDP proxy needs to be able to map the client to proxy quick connection plus a datagram flow ID into the server facing socket that it needs to send out on. That's already existing state. If you support forwarding mode, you essentially just have an equivalent mapping to that same server facing socket based on the incoming client facing socket um, in addition in addition to the 
target server's connection ID. So you're adding one entry there. Next slide. And then in the reverse direction, um, again, you already have a case in which when you receive a packet, you need to know which client to send it to on which Dataram flow ID. If you are sharing a single server facing socket, so the socket between a proxy and the server for multiple quick connections, that's where you need to know about the client's connection ID to be able to demux it to the right client connection. And if you're doing the forwarded mode, you need to know which socket that goes on to. So there definitely is state here. Um, it is comparable, um, just slightly more complex to compared to the existing state that a proxy needs to have. Next slide. Uh, actually, Tommy, we're we're yeah. sort of at cap now for time. Right. Um, so this is an introduction, and people can just take questions to the list. Great, or, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and this is old. That was from last time. All right. Um, thank you, Tommy. Uh, Miria, we have uh, like just shy of five minutes. That's fine. I mean, we can even take a few minutes if people have urgent questions to Tommy. That will be fine for me. But it didn't seem to be the case. So I actually only wanted to, and this is a little bit outdated now because we had a lot of discussion about this just now. I just wanted to show the next slide, this one. Um, because like when I reviewed um, the uh, first time the requirements document, it was very obvious to me that the solution the authors had on their mind is, uh, is the right one in this picture, where you have in the um, quick payload, you have like the full IP packet with the IP header. While when I started working on this, I rather had a solution like the one on the left side in my mind, where uh, you only take the payload of the IP header and then the proxy has to reconstruct the IP header. The reason why I was looking at that solution is because the difference between that and I, a UDP connect isn't that big. It's like only a few features you need to add. So we have all the functionality already at the proxy. Um, uh, and I had a different use case on mine, right? So I don't want to have a discussion about what's the right solution. And there might be a hybrid solution where you can like add some fields and whatever. I just wanted to, to, to show the slide to make sure that like we came from two different sites. And I think we already agreed in the previous discussion that we should not put anything in the requirement document that pre um, precludes one of the solutions here. Um, those might be valid and there might be pro and cons that we can discuss at a later point of time. So um, that was really like, I wanted to show the slide like a while ago because it seems like we were kind of talking past each other because we really had like different um, things in my mind. And then we don't have to go through the rest of the slides because I was just reviewing the requirement document and the requirements in there with like my solution and try to comment based on that or not my solution, but the solution where you only take the payload um, and try to comment on that and try to figure out how this fits together. And, and based on that, I also would like to make one more comment. So we have uh, only a few requirements in the requirement draft that are really specific to IP proxying. And a lot of requirements are more generic to um, proxying and mask and could, you know, I might are also valid for, for UDP proxying basically. So I think it would be good to separate this and to make sure that we also have all the requirements which are more general um, correctly addressed in our um, connect UDP solution. So that might give us some insights for things we need to do there still. Um, but that's it. I don't think we have to go through the rest of the slides. Okay. Um, thank you, Miria. Just uh, quickly, after having gone through the exercise uh, that you've you've gone through to produce this uh, this document, these slides, um, what uh, would you say would be the impact on the requirements document, and uh, are there issues tracking those potential changes? Yeah, you don't I have to go through we... them now. If there's a lot, no, I yeah. just no, like, yeah, if I there think... are issues. So you can look at this and there are some questions. So I think we have or we have issues for that, but um, it's also a little bit that um, this problem that I believe the authors had a certain solution in mind and the way it's described in the requirements document uh, is not is not clearly stating a requirement on a requirement level or is like missing some background about what is the actual use case the scenario they want to address with that requirement, which made it really hard for me. To access this, so it's. Uh, I think it's more editorial work in a lot of cases, but as we decided to have a requirement document, I think we have to come to some agreement there and make sure we understand each other. Okay, um, and so of course, uh, filing issues and sending PRs to the document to help clean up the editorial things and perhaps make it more clear to others would be 
see. I mean, I I'm, not, I'm, saying, I'm not saying it's only editorial, but I need first to to actually understand what what the grammar is to be to find some agreement. So there's some more explanation missing in some cases. Okay. Um, so I'd like to request that um, if there's not already issues tracking the the particular things you'd like clarity on, uh, to please file them so we can have the discussion there. Uh, Alex queued up. Um, Alex, is it quick? Uh, it is. I mostly just wanted to say one thing. Um, the, the requirements document, I apologize that it comes across as vague in some ways. We are trying very hard to not be overly specific. Um, but so I definitely am open to suggestions on how to incorporate use cases without getting into the weeds. Yeah, I think it, it does. It does make sense to be a little bit more specific on the use cases. And uh, and then be more not wake, but like to to stick on a requirements level for the actual requirements. But you, we still have to understand the use cases and the actual scenario behind that. I think. Cool. All right. Um, that about wraps it up. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. A uh, special thanks to uh, uh, to Mike and Lucas for taking notes for everything. Um, uh, next steps are uh, Eric and myself. We will send out a consensus call for the HP3 datagrams um, document to see if that uh, if there's interest in adopting that. As discussed, um, the, the issues and topics that were discussed during David's Connect UDP draft um, are either uh, continue being discussed on the GitHub issues, or we'll file new issues to elaborate on some of the things that were perhaps unclear. Um, and we encourage everyone to follow along with that work going forward um, and continue the discussion. Um, Martin, did you have anything you want to say before we close out? Well, first of all, thank you to the chairs, but also please remember to update contributing.mv so that we have all these uh, policies written down. Thank you. And with that, we can close. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Make everyone. good choices. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.